Taking the controls for aviation's next great leap. From the National Business Aviation Association, this is Flight Plan. I'm Rob Finfrock. Advanced Air Mobility, or AAM, holds new opportunities for intercity, regional travel, and beyond, including for business aviation. While AAM may have seemed a long ways off just a few years ago, today there are several AAM aircraft undergoing flight testing and certification programs. And today, I'm joined by three test pilots who are putting these electrically powered vertical takeoff and landing, or EVTOL, aircraft through their paces. A job that, not surprisingly, they're pretty excited to talk about. I'm going to put myself in the passenger's shoes, and I, I arrive at a heliport, and I go through a quick check-in procedure and get into this EVTOL aircraft, and I've never done it before, but I'm very excited about it because I've heard great things about it. And I'm about to get downtown in about six and a half minutes, because that's what I've been told it takes. Peter Wilson is the Director of Flight Standards and Training for Joby Aviation. And then, sure enough, in double quick time, the, the propellers are spinning and, and now we're taking off. And, and now the excitement of flight, like low level, low altitude flight, a thousand feet um, above the city center, cruising on at a nice speed, looking down and you're slowing down at the far end and coming into land right in downtown. And you can see your office block just over there and, and you get out with this like momentous experience that you just had and you realize you can do it every day. I mean, that's that's pretty cool. Imagine being the pilot that can introduce that to the market. That's a that's a cool job. One of the coolest things to me about AAM is how different they are from the aircraft and helicopters we're used to. But they do also share many familiar traits. Mike Luvara is an engineer at WISC on their Generation 6 eVTOL. You're blending both vertical and fixed wing flight. So having an aircraft that has almost three flight regimes, you know, hover, a transition phase, and then wingborne is often a different thing for people to get used to. It comes from traditional aviation. My third guest today is Nate Moyer, team member and test pilot at Beta Technologies. Nate, has there been anything unexpected you've encountered when operating your company's Alia AAM vehicle? The most unexpected thing was that it's really not all that different. The aircraft is really stable, so you don't have to do nearly as much as you think you do. And then obviously, for every electric vehicle, the startup and shutdown process is stupidly quick, uh, which is a huge advantage. Um, so it takes me, you know, 10 to 15 seconds to be ready for takeoff after I strap in instead of 5 to 10, 20 minutes. I really love the response about the startup and shutdown. Uh, we call that power up and power down because you're really not starting anything. You're just ma basically making the electricity available to, to the uh, EPUs or the electric propulsion units. So I, I love that piece of it. Peter, what surprised you a bit about operating Joby's S4 aircraft? I think a big surprise to me is just the changes that we can make to the aircraft from one day to the next because there's just an amazing team uh, supporting what we do. F many different parts of industry have come together around the aircraft and the convergence of, of kind of, you know, Silicon Valley software type companies with uh, traditional aviation companies means that we can move very in a very agile way. And if we land and we see something we don't like, it can be just a matter of hours before it's fixed. So uh, for me, that's a, a phenomenal uh, aspect to what we're doing. Would pilots operating AAM vehicles benefit from having experience operating conventional helicopters, Peter? It depends on the strategy that the aircraft in question is is using. We decided that we were going to go with a unified control all, which means that you keep height on your right hand. So your right hand is controlling height all the time and your left hand is controlling speed. And so it doesn't matter whether you're in the hover or whether you're moving at higher speeds. Right hand is height, left hand is speed. And so to a degree, you need a bit more time to get used to it. If you're a helicopter pilot coming to the S4 and you probably need a little bit less time if you haven't got that helicopter experience. We've since gone away towards autonomy and removed the traditional controls. You know, so we don't have a collective lever. We're not utilizing translational lift and certain things. And we don't, you, you know, you can't um, auto rotate most of these eVTOLs. So I think understandings of rotor craft are good. I don't think they necessarily have to have a deep background. For us, the, the aircraft is doing the flying itself and all the controls are blended. So you're giving it more high level input commands. Very interesting, Mike. Nate, what difference is most striking to you between flying an AAM and a conventional aircraft? The really surprising bit is how reliable the engines are and how few moving parts there are. We really cut down on maintenance timelines compared to a traditional aircraft, certainly a 7,000 pound traditional aircraft. The maintenance 
downtime and the, the costs are dramatically reduced compared to anything else I've ever flown. And then I, I would say it's surprising how much it flies just like another aircraft once you are in one of the three regimes that Mike talked about. Obviously, one of them is transition, so that's kind of a little different, but it, it really didn't feel all that different, uh, especially doing it low over the ground like we did for the first one. Um, it felt a lot like being in a glider. I think it's pretty comparable if you have helicopter time or glider time or fixed wing time in any meaningful amounts. At least part of this is going to feel identical to what you're used to, which was pretty surprising to me. I'm sure these blended controls and transitional phases require a high level of computer input to make happen safely and reliably. Peter? The computers on board our aircraft could not be more fundamental to the operation of it. We're sort of a software company that is building airplanes that can hover. In reality, the amount of software on board is, is unbelievable. And without that software, you really can't go anywhere. You can completely change the character of the aircraft from one minute to the next by, by simply changing the software load. To Peter's point about software changes, it's amazing when you find a problem, go back to engineering and they'll fix it in a quick fashion. So it's taking the autonomy level of airlines and all the other fly-by-wire aircraft, I think, to the next level and, and simplifying the operations for flight. Nate? We've taken the opposite approach to the other two teams in that the pilot is the central important piece in the aircraft, and we want to make sure that that stays that way. So we're taking technologies that were designed to keep four or 500 people safe on an airliner, and we're porting them down to a 7,000-pound airplane, and we're bringing a lot of those safety features, but we're still trying to not fly the aircraft for you. The computer assist is really an interpretation between the pilot's thoughts and the aircraft response. And we're we're going for the most carefree handling possible and the safest aircraft possible, while at the same time allowing the pilot to make the final decision on everything. It's neat that we're going to see both autonomous and hand-flown AAM aircraft. And that brings up another question. Based on your experiences flying these aircraft, how will AAM ultimately integrate into the national airspace system, Nate? What I've learned is that it already does. Over the last year or so, I've flown the aircraft through the the freeze through the DC CIFRA, through the Hudson Corridor, through a bunch of class Bravos. And it's, you get a lot of questions like, hey, what is is that? Because it looks very different. But at a fundamental level, it already integrates into the NAS very well. And it is just another airplane from that perspective. So that was was pretty surprising to me. We got to build up to these long cross countries uh, through some more uh, flight testing that frankly probably sounds pretty boring to a lot of people, as I'm sure Peter and Mike will Backup flight testing is very rarely like the right stuff, but you build up to it slowly because at a certain point, like it has to be safe enough for me to bet my life on it. And we do that regularly. And so for us to be able to fly over hundreds of thousands of people in New York City or D.C. uh, was a, a pretty validating moment for us. I love the mention about the right stuff. Do we wish it was like the right stuff? I I think we don't, right? (laughs) A little bit too experimental for my liking, so I'm glad it's not like that anymore. Anyway, I agree. We we do fit into the NAS, but the, the, the interesting thing is where do we really want to operate? A lot of our flights are going to be from the suburbs into downtown on a, you know, pick a city around the world. There'll be many, many cities where this model fits incredibly well, and but... The challenge is if you want to be able to do that with a high density of aircraft, start to move some of the motion of people into the air and and save people time, save many, many people hours every day uh, would be would be the dream of any of these companies. Um, and, and that way you develop the customers who are going to return every day. Um, but to do that, you've got to be able to op- operate somewhat with some some sort of freedom down below or in the class Bravo airspace, but in the lower couple of thousand feet where you're underneath the airliners. And, and I think that's where the interesting piece is. And that's the reason why new air traffic services maybe or air traffic rules and regs need to be developed so that we do have the freedom to be able to operate where we truly want to. To Peter's point about, you know, new regulations and ways to deal with ATC or something that our team's actively working on. Um, but we've done several big offsite demonstrations the last few years. Then we went to Oshkosh and we went to Long Beach and did public demonstrations there, but also did test flight buildups. And I think one of the things we've learned that anything new people are a little apprehensive about. So EV tolls to them are a new the foreign object, I guess. And so there was a lot of acceptance that had to happen from both regulators, both the public, and even as we work towards public acceptance, you know, because it's a new and exciting area, but there's, there's just a lot to be learned in the, um, 
in the integration standpoint, I think, because more of it is fear. We did an Oshkosh forum last year, too, talking about with the GA people saying, we're not taking your airspace away. But at the same time, people see something and they hear autonomous, they hear that it's going to be, there's going to be lots of these around. That has been an education, I think, for a lot of people to understand that it's a new and exciting technology that will play a part. And first and foremost, be safe. Let's circle back to flight testing. What are some of the unique aspects involved in putting an AAM through its paces? And how do you determine when to expand the envelope? Mike, let me start with you. I would argue that it's not different than any other test program because your ultimate goal is managing risk and looking at that in a safe execution. But there's some unique challenges, in, and some people have allayed this to like kind of the modern era or the jet era when jets came out versus pistons. There was a lot to be learned. But I think you have to challenge the status quo at times in both how you test and, you know, just because we've done it one way forever doesn't mean that that's the same way. But I, I would say we learn something new at every every turn, you know, and every program I've been on here at least has shown me something new and given us, you know, ways to look at processes and improvements in that testing. And, you know, I'm sure both Nate and Peter have similar um, aspects. For an example, we'd look at merging both hover, fixed wing, certain speed expansions up to a point. Like when they did our first MAN program, um, you know, they did hover flights. We did a whole fixed wing envelope without any booms on, built up, tested the aircraft, and then built a um, test program where they did hover up to 40 knots, uh, low speed stuff over the ground. Then they went to altitude and walked backwards. And then for the final transition flights, merge the two together. And so we've come up with, for our latest set of vehicles, a much more refined set of test points, test plans that enable us to do that in a faster method. Interestingly enough, I looked on the Society of Experimental Test Pilots log of papers for that specific thing. Um, So unfortunately, Mike, I didn't actually find that anywhere, but we essentially recreated that from scratch on our end. So we built up in speed in forward translational flight from a hover with some frequency sweeps and some more technical data collection maneuvers as we expanded the speed. And then we slowed back down to uh, just above stall and fixed wing with the lift kit off and then with the lift kit on again. And then we kind of closed that by slowing down below stall with the lift kit on up at altitude so that if something had not gone the way we predicted, we had plenty of safety margin. And then we kind of closed that last little bit uh, on the, the day of the transition. I think it's worthwhile also mentioning some of the stuff that we do on the ground, uh, which I'm quite sure every company is doing, because you really don't want to just put a new software load uh, onto a vehicle and then go take it flying without having done fairly exhaustive checks on the ground. We have software verification laboratories, inter- integrated test laboratories, in which, ca- in which uh, we have hardware in the loop. So we can truly put the hardware uh, through the paces on the ground and actually recreate the forces of flight and and use the software in the way it will be used. So it's as close as you can possibly get to the real environment while being on the ground. But of course, it misses real air data where there can be turbulence and bumps in the air that you don't see typically when you're doing it in the lab. And and there can be vibrations that you pick up through your airframe that you don't necessarily recreate in the lab. So just any number of things that make flight tests very worthwhile, even though you can get close on the ground, you can't really get there. So as we take a new software load into flight and look to expand the envelope, and of course, Expanding the envelope isn't just about putting a new software load on. That's one way you would expand your envelope by putting new features and new capabilities in through new software. Test pilots, in my mind, fundamentally are just risk reduction devices. So you're doing your best to to minimize the risk while successfully acquiring the data. But the minute you stop learning is the moment you start dying. And so as test pilots, you know, just because a technique has worked for the last 30 years doesn't mean it's the right technique for us going forward. So I'd be interested to see if you guys are going to write any papers on uh, what has changed for you guys. I know we've floated a couple of ideas around uh, at Beta about things we want to push out to the wider test pilot community. So I'd be interested to see that. I think we will be doing more of that in the future as we, you know, learnings and sharing that within the community because it is important. I agree with both of you wholeheartedly uh, about everything you said. So I'll switch out to a slightly different topic, one that we maybe haven't touched on hugely, which is the nature of batteries. They're weird. They're not like fuel. They're not like the conventional gas. I mean, fuel burns at a rate that is very predictable. And if you've got a certain amount left in the tank, you kind of look at what it is and and you can predict what you're going to be able to do with it. A battery's not like that. So here's just an example. And and folks who use iPhones or or electric cars will will be aware of this, I'm sure, is if you use the energy in a battery aggressively, 
the point at which it ceases to give energy changes. And so if you use it aggressively, you're going to get less out of it than if you use it more gently. And that is a really, really interesting problem for pilots to solve, because especially when you on the end of your flight, you have a vertical landing and you by definition have to use some of that uh, energy more aggressively. And so how do you predict, and this is like a soft facing question that I'm asking myself, how does one predict how much energy you got left and, and when can you afford to land and when can't you afford to land? And I guess my, my question to both the others, although I don't think I'm going to get an answer out of them because it's one of these sort of somewhat proprietary things right now. It's like, how are you guys handling range and endurance? Because it's a really, really fascinating problem to solve. That's a great question. And I, I know our training team is working on it a lot. I don't know that we've settled on a final answer there, but we, we've put a ton of effort into that particular portion of the pilot training. And I think we're circling around a really tight answer right now. I think it comes down to your your internal processes and basically your algorithms that give you predictions and, you know, your mission profile. And that, but there also is the unexpected profile. And so probably without giving anything away too much is that you need enough in the tank so that you're not going to go down to that level. And that means a higher reserve potentially. Um, and that's, I know, a lot of topics of like, what is a reserve for EV tolls? Is it the traditional VFR reserve? Is it when you're in hover mode? Is it flight? Is it blended? And I think it's a challenge because batteries are a unique addition to um, to the to the aircraft sector. And I know a lot of us use the analogy: you can't just pull over like a car. I'm really enjoying this conversation, and we could probably talk about this subject for hours. But one question I'm sure a few of our listeners may be thinking about is, if they want to fly an AAM at some point, what should they be doing right now? Peter? The generation of folks that are going to be operating these aircraft are so familiar with technology because they've been brought up with it. And so I I think the idea is continue to be excited uh, by technology. There's some, some steps that can be taken. For example... In order to operate one of these EV tolls in commercial service, you're going to need to have a commercial uh, pilot certificate uh, with, with with whichever regulatory authority is, is your local authority. So take the FAA, for example, you're going to need to get several hundred hours of flight time. But then just stick at it. I mean, I think with all of us, we don't get into these positions uh, in relatively senior places being able to do experimental flights um, without sticking at it. Sometimes learning to fly is hard. Um, and sometimes uh, it's glorious, and, and there are times when you, when you just have to get your head down and stick at it and study the material. Mike, what's your advice? I have a unique background in this because I never saw myself getting into the test pilot role. I have an engineering degree in electrical. I started out with model airplanes as a kid, like a lot of people do, then got my private pilot's license, went through commercial, CFI, and some others. And so I fell into this role here at WISC. It was something I never expected. If someone's in college or high school listening to this, get involved in model airplanes, drones, other things that you understand, because I wouldn't be where I was today had I not understood simple aerodynamics from those things, you know, and and playing around in the garage when I was a kid and aerodynamics and designing things. So learn, seek it, and take the skills that you have and build on them. Just never stop learning. Indeed. Nate? At the basic level, whether the pilot's in the airplane or not, I think you need to have a, a really solid grounding in how airplanes work and how aerodynamics work. So that tinkering around in a garage playing with model airplanes is fantastic. And then I think if you are actually interested in the sector, you need to build on that with actual flight time and you really need to enjoy it. If you want to be active in the aviation community and the aviation business, you, you need to love it because it does demand quite a bit from you. And if you don't love it, it it's not going to work out for you. So I would say find a part of it that you enjoy that is fun for you and then focus on that. And for me, that's flying the airplane. Great advice and insights. And I'd like to thank the three of you again for sharing your perspectives and experiences on this really fast evolving segment of our industry. And to keep up to date on the latest developments in advanced air mobility and business aviation, be sure to also check out nbaa.org forward slash AAM. And that's the latest from the National Business Aviation Association. Remember, you can subscribe to all Flight Plan episodes wherever you find your favorite podcasts or by asking your virtual assistant or connected device. You can also download Flight Plan directly from nbaa.org. I'm Rob Finfrock. Thanks for listening and join us next time for a new episode of Flight Plan. Uh, We got him inside. We're slowing back to 170.